Joining us on the line right now, the host of Special Report on your Fox News channel, Brett Baer. Good morning to you, Brett. Good morning. You really uh, had quite a little scoop there on Benghazi, and we think this is a fascinating story. Rather than have me recount what happened, sure. why don't you tell the story of this pilot that you interviewed? Yeah, pilot, uh, he's retired now, Major Eric Stahl. He was the commander of the C-17 that went into Tripoli to pull out the uh, bodies of Chris Stevens and the three others and the uh, and the survivors from Benghazi. So uh, he went in. Part of the story was... Um, that they were on standby, the C-17 crew, he and his crew, uh, in Germany, and what's called Bravo Alert status. And they said they could have been in Benghazi in five hours all in. Um, so that kind of raised questions about what assets were available to evacuate those guys on the ground. It depended on when, obviously, they were tapped to go in. But perhaps more interesting was the conversations he had with the CIA guys the survivors from Benghazi in the days after uh, they were they came back uh, when he flew them back to uh, Germany. Um, first of all, he said the U.S. ambassador to Germany was the first one to debrief um, the Benghazi survivors, which is different than what we've heard, and it puts it right in the chain of the State Department to hear firsthand what um, what they said. And second of all. He said that they were really puzzled by all this coverage and all this talk about a video. And um, he said they knew from the very start who it was that was attacking with RPGs and mortars. And they knew during. And he said, how did you know during? And they said that they, from higher ups, had had signals intelligence, and that's uh, essentially intercepted calls, of the bad guys using State Department cell phones or blackberries that were recovered during the battle and calling their higher ups the u.s government listened to that conversation and then relayed that info he said to the um the team on the ground oh. as the battle was happening all right so during the attack the bad guys get a hold of state department cell phones they're there in the compound right and they start calling their higher ups and and that seems to suggest that this was indeed more organized and not a, a a something that spiraled out of a protest over a video. Sure, or at least, and they knew this in real time. These guys did definitively, and um, that's what he relayed. Well, and and you lead to the next question. These guys knew. Who else knew? Who high up, uh, up above knew? Well, if there was such intelligence, um, one would think the National Security Council would be in the loop of of that. Uh, and a number of other people. And, um, you know, these analysts that uh, Mike Morrell references that he relied on at the CIA rather than the guys on the ground uh, to say that there was some protest, um, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling to think that they would miss something that was happening real time. Well, last time I checked, the Secretary of State sits on the National Security Council, Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. And also, you know, the fact that the U.S. ambassador in Germany debriefed these guys hmm. uh, once they got to Germany, um, one would think that the U.S. ambassador perhaps would put that info up the chain. Well, now hold it, Brett. You've got an interview with uh, the former Secretary of State coming up. I do. On and, and one might imagine that this is something that you would talk to her about. Well, I don't know, Brian. <laughs> Still still marking that down. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to that interview, uh, Brett, and I know you don't want to, you know, uh, I mean, obviously we want to let everyone know that it's happening. You and Greta Van Susteren for a half-hour interview on June 17th with uh, the former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Um, what I'm interested in, it, uh, when I'm watching these interviews, what's frustrating me is that so many of these interviewers are repeating the same questions. And, and I'm, I suspect you might sort of take up where they left off and sure. then move forward, I hope. Yeah, we're watching yeah. a lot of these um, interviews, obviously, and... I've talked to Greta, and we're, we're essentially going to start at 6.45 p.m. It'll be live on my set, um, and we will go for a half an hour into Greta's show and end at 7.15.
Going to be great, great television. Hey, Brett, uh, by the way, our guest is Brett Baer, and we want to remind you of his new book, Special Heart, A Journey of Faith, Hope, Courage, and Love. I get it. Uh, it's getting great reviews. And I wanted to ask you about the other. I mean, you had this great scoop, but also what a week it was in Washington with yeah. Eric Cantor, the majority leader, the first in history. Uh, they instituted the uh, office in 1899. It's been since then, and no majority leaders ever lost a primary like this. Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing story, um, earth-shattering as far as possible politics goes, um, and and races. I think as everybody's digesting that race, it was more uh, anti-establishment uh, than it was any one issue. It was more perhaps Eric Cantor showing up with, you know, a entourage of SUVs and people to events and, uh, and the jockeying for leadership um, rather than the constituents and where they felt they were being represented. I think you know, uh, one issue didn't overtake that um, that race in, in a couple of days, you know, after analysis. So I'm hearing a couple of things. I'm hearing aloof, not in not in contact. We, we, people who, who listened to this program who voted in that election said, you know, we just felt like he'd sort of, you know, lost uh, our interest in what we cared about. Yeah. Then the other thing was that, you know, if some people have suggested that maybe some Democrats crossed over there and sort of, you know, to sort of enter the fray there. Yeah. You know, I think um, it could be a combination of that. Uh, his campaign is saying it was Democrats. Um, the primary, though, you know, there were 18,000 more voters than there were in yeah. 2012. Um, whether that was filling the gap with an open primary and people trying to get them out, or whether it was really energized uh, conservatives, which it, it may have been. Wow. And so now what's next? Uh, the, the, the palace intrigue, it looks as though now that uh, some of the names that were be floating, floated around as challengers to Kevin McCarthy are dropping out. And Raul Labrador apparently is the only challenger standing so yeah. far. Yeah, he will. Uh, McCarthy will get it. Um, he's he's kind of already it's already baked in the cake um, from what we're hearing on Capitol Hill. The real the race will be for majority whip his previous position. And um and I think the Republican Party will try to move forward on, on unity and, and learn from that, that race. Um, there's a lot of learning to do. I, I do want to say one thing on the international front. Okay. The story that Weekly Standard had, Tom Jocelyn, who does an amazing job of tracking these bad guys, al-Qaeda, Taliban, the whole thing, he has a story out that one of the five Taliban released were directly tied to the 9-11 plot. There was a three-stage plot to 9-11. It is outlined in the 9-11 Commission report, the bipartisan report. And this guy, one of the five, is tied directly to that. That is a big, big development and one that will explode um, because all this stuff about they're not going to be a threat. Uh, it's right. tough to see that they're not a threat wow. to the homeland when one of them is tied directly to the plot I had, of 9 I had not heard that. That's awesome. Thank you for That's that. Awesome. And, and yes, and Hillary Clinton, in one of her interviews, I believe it was yesterday morning or maybe the day before, assured America that these five would not be a threat. Maybe a threat to Afghanistan, but certainly not to the United States. Yeah. So wow. check that out. It's going All to right. really get big today. Real quick, do you think we'll see airstrikes in Iraq? I think that it may it may happen. Um, it, this, uh, the administration will be reticent to do it, but the Iraqis uh, cannot do it. Uh, they don't have the expertise to fly uh, missions, and uh, they're going to need some help, whether it's the U.S. or somebody. Um, right. That force is really moving, and it's different. It is different than just a ragtag group. It is it is a forming group of terrorists that have battalions taking over cities. Wow. It's a different ball game. All right. Brett Bear, thank you very Great much. Stuff. Thanks, guys. Big week. Yeah, thanks for that. And looking forward to the.